you're just in time for the Bible Answer Man broadcast with Hank Hanegraaff, the radio outreach of the Christian Research Institute. Our purpose here at CRI is to equip Christians to provide biblical answers to life's most important questions, to read the Bible for all it's worth, and counter the teachings of cults and world religions that deviate from the plumb line of God's Word, because life and truth matter. For more information, to order resources or donate, call 888-7000-CRI or go online to equip.org. That's equip.org. The following program was pre-recorded. Now here's the president of the Christian Research Institute, Hank Hanegraaff. Thank you very much, Randy. And of course, this week we are making a trek. We're making a trek from Palm Sunday when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem in precisely the way that Zechariah said that he would. Zechariah 9, verse 9. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then, of course, we went from Palm Sunday to talking about the four-part argument that St. Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the four-part argument that underscores the fact that Christ has, in fact, risen from the dead. And because Christ has risen from the dead, we know that we too will rise immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. And as I said on yesterday's broadcast, it is so important that you take the time to familiarize yourself with 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Paul there is taking a creedal statement, a statement that can be traced almost up to the time of Messiah's murder, and he's using that creedal statement as a way of demonstrating an incontrovertible fact. The fact that Jesus suffered fatal torment. Again, we talked about that yesterday. The fact that the tomb is empty. I'm going to talk about that today. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the fact that Christ appeared and gave many convincing proofs that he had indeed risen from the dead. This was not conjecture. This was fact. And then... On Friday, we are going to talk about what happened to the disciples as a result of the resurrection of our Lord. They were utterly transformed. They were scared and scattered and then became lions of the faith. They were able to turn an empire right side up. And I've often said that if we ever got a hold of the reality of resurrection in our time, we could take our empire and turn it right side up. So the question becomes, are you just talking about resurrection? Maybe giving it lip service, spending a little time on it because it's Easter? Or do you really believe that Christ rose from the dead and because he rose, you know that you too will rise immortal, imperishable, incorruptible. So today I want to focus on the empty tomb. And to do that, let me read what St. Matthew says. This is from Matthew chapter 27. Of course, this is the second to the last chapter in St. Matthew's gospel. Here's the words of St. Matthew, starting at verse 57. Now, when evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea, a rich man named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded that the body be given to Joseph of Arimathea. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his tomb, a tomb which he had hewn out of the rock. And 
And then he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there. And and the other Mary, sitting opposite the tomb. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate. And they said, Sir, we remember when... When he was still alive, how the deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to his people, He has risen from the dead, so that the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him. They became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Don't be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where Jesus lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. So this is, again, the account of the empty tomb as told by St. Matthew. And this is perhaps the greatest of all testimonies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, it is a congruent whole, but it is a great testimony that the tomb was empty, that Christianity cannot survive an identifiable tomb containing the corpse of Christ. And as it is incontrovertible that Christ suffered fatal torment, so therefore it is beyond all reasonable doubt that Christ was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, this has constantly been called into question. And so, as we continue the broadcast today, what I'd like to do is give you evidence, incontrovertible evidence, that the tomb was indeed empty. And again, as we read through the gospel according to St. Matthew, this was not a common grave. This was a tomb that is identifiable because it belonged to a Sanhedrist. And as a Sanhedrist, someone who was involved in condemning Christ to death, He was on the very court that did that. It is unlikely that Joseph of Arimathea is Christian fiction. So again, we're going to be talking about all of that and more on this edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. And as I do, remember that this is not just a story for me to tell you, but this is a story for you to tell others. It is not a story in the sense of fable. It is a story in the sense of undeniable reality. In fact, 
Again, as the Apostle Paul said, if Christ has not risen from the dead, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die, but Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. It is incontrovertible that Jesus Christ suffered fatal torment, but it is also beyond reasonable doubt that Jesus Christ was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. As the reliability of the resurrection was undermined in so many different venues, in, in magazines, in manuscripts, and movies, it became increasingly critical to look at the rationale for believing that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and, and that on Easter morning some 2,000 years ago, the tomb was indeed empty. Now, again, this is not blind faith. This is faith founded on a refutable fact. Let me start by saying this. It is heartening to discover that the late liberal Cambridge scholar, John A.T. Robinson, and I mention him because many people know his name, he conceded that the burial of Jesus Christ is, and let me read what he said, it's one of the earliest and best attested facts about Jesus. This is a liberal scholar. And his affirmation turns out to be more than just a dogmatic assertion. It's a defensible argument. In fact, let me go so far as to say that liberal New Testament scholars such as Robinson, in concert with conservative scholarship, agree that the body of Jesus was buried in the private tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And as I said before the break, as a Sanhedrist, one in the court that condemns Christ to death, he is unlikely to be the figment of a fertile imagination. It's also striking that no alternative burial account occurs in the entire historical record. Scholars also agree that the tomb quickly lost its significance. Why? Because the remains of Christ were not there to be venerated. And that's noteworthy in that the graves of sages were profoundly reverenced. And let me add this, that the account of Jesus' burial in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea as put forth in the Gospels is far too early to have been the stuff of myth or legend. And you can add to this the reality that the Gospel writers highlight women as heroes of the empty tomb accounts. Now, this is important because if you consider that females were routinely considered little more than chattel, the empty tomb accounts are powerful evidence that the gospel writers value truth over cultural correctness. Prior to the coming of Christ, and again, this is the historical context, females were so denigrated by society that first century males routinely mouthed the mantra, I thank thee that I'm not a woman. Had the gospel accounts been legendary, I can tell you this, males most certainly would have been the heroes of the narrative. Now, I think it's also heartening to realize that, that Jewish antagonists take the empty tomb account for granted. Instead of repudiating the empty tomb, they accused Christ's disciples of stealing his body. 
And had the tomb not been empty, enemies, (laughs) you can imagine this, enemies of the resurrection could have easily put an end to the pretense by displaying the remains of Christ. Here's the bottom line. In the centuries following the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the fact of the empty tomb was forwarded by friends and foes alike. Let me put it bluntly. The tomb was empty. Were it not, Christianity could not have survived the tomb containing the remains of Messiah. Well, as the reliability of the resurrection is undermined in the media, it is so crucial that you and I as Christians are prepared to demonstrate that Jesus was buried and that on Easter morning some 2,000 years ago, the tomb was indeed empty. Now, I'm going to pick that up. in, in tomorrow's edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast, when we talk about the appearances of Christ. But right now, I want to answer a question that I've been asked so often on the Bible Answer Man broadcast, and that is the question, was Jesus really in the grave for three days and three nights? And I raise that question because skeptics so often point to this as an inconsistency in the biblical text. Now, Jesus specifically said, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The Gospels also tell us that Jesus died on the day before the Sabbath or on Friday, and then rose on the day after the Sabbath or on Sunday. So, how how do you resolve this kind of apparent contradiction, the operative word being apparent. Well, you do that in three ways. The first is that in Jewish idiom, any part of a day counted as a day-night unit. And thus, there is absolutely no need whatsoever to demand that a literal 72 hours has to be accounted for. Uh, In fact, this way of speaking in reference to time is particularly evident in light of Jesus' own contention that he would rise on the third day, not after the third day and night had ended. There's a second point, and that is that the Gospels unanimously declare that Jesus died on the day of preparation, in other words, on Friday, the day leading up to the beginning of the Sabbath at sundown, the gospel writers demonstrate a a complete unanimity regarding the discovery of Jesus' resurrection early in the morning on the day following the Sabbath as well, and that, of course, is Sunday, the first day of the week. And thus to suggest, as some have, that Jesus died on Wednesday and rose on Saturday, or died on Thursday and rose on Sunday, directly contradicts the testimony of the four gospel writers. So you can't go there. And that leaves us with with, with one more point that I want to make in this regard, and that is, once knowledge of Ancient culturally informed modes of oral and literary expression replace a naive, literalistic interpretation of God's Word. The majestic harmony of Scripture shines through. Indeed, Christ's sacrificial death, His miraculous resurrection on the third day, is the glorious archetypal fulfillment of of Old Testament types, including the Passover lamb, including Jonah's preservation for three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, and including the restoration of Israel on the third day as prophesied by the prophet Hosea. So, People try to make a big deal out of the idea that Jesus wasn't in the grave for exactly 72 hours. But the biblical text actually not only does not necessitate that, but 
it 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 actually communicates that Jesus was in the grave according to Hebrew idiom for parts of three days and nights. Well, again, I think that the the point that I want to make overall is the tomb is empty, and uh, Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and that Christianity could not survive an identifiable tomb containing the corpse of Christ. Again, on tomorrow's broadcast, I'm going to talk about the appearances of Jesus Christ. He appeared first to Peter, then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom, says St. Paul, are living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also. This is going to be exciting because the appearances absolutely transformed those to whom Christ appeared. See you tomorrow.